Well, shalom, shalom. I am Rebecca Kahab Bat Yehovah from Tishuvu Ministries, and welcome to my 2021 summer series, The Fat Earth, <laughs> Fat Earth, <laughs> The Flat Earth uh, Deception <laughs> or Delusion, whatever. Anyway, today it is uh, number nine in episode number nine, and today we're going to talk about biblical imagery and Bible as a science book. So in episode eight, we talked about observable phenomena that actually would not work in a flat earth model. So uh, just a little housekeeping again before we start, uh, like, subscribe, hit the bell, go to our website, get <laughs> on our email database, um, support us financially uh, through PayPal or Cash App, links are below. Go to the university, Kingdom University, take some of our courses uh, and get into the vault where this uh, script will be so that you can have access to that as well as my daughter's article on Flat Earth um, that'll be there at some point. As I've said before in the beginning of these videos uh, in the summer series, we have been studying as a family Flat Earth and <laughs> what's true, uh, which Flat Earth is not true, um, but we have been kind of in a deep dark hole for the last month and it's been very difficult. We've all been grumpy because um, it's just such a, a, an insane concept. And um, I'd like to point out here before we start looking at biblical imagery, there are a lot of really great teaching videos out there from other people who've done a, a phenomenal job on piecing together, you know, the history of Flat Earth Movement and why it's here and what they believe and how they do this pseudoscience and um, all this. There's some, there's just a lot of really good teachers out there that are trying to fight this and come at it. Uh, they come at it from different angles. So my angle is different than some of theirs, but I'm going to put some links in the description below, below in, in all of these videos here in the summer series. So you can go and check them out. And some of the things in there, you know, some are evolutionists and some, but you have to just be discerning and look at what they're teaching and what angle they're coming at coming at it from and there is a lot of great information in there to give you some knowledge so that you can have understanding all right so um you know uh, one of the ones i was just listening to just now was talking about um the history of science and how as things in the 1800s were um you know science was becoming more and more complicated and uh, people were making these incredible observations not just in the 1800s but even but way before that actually when they were making instruments uh, by which they could make observations and how those observations were headed all towards a spherical earth you know it kind of got away from you know tactile you know i can see it with my own eyes thing and so people got kind of you know away from what is right in front of you and so there is a resurgence resurgence lately in this um in since 2017 which we've talked about before um in that people are just sick and tired of being lied to you're probably one of them i'm sick and tired of being lied to about religion and other things but this is one thing you're not being lied to about as far as the shape of the earth you're being lied to about you know that the earth is flat that was like dissolved and resolved you know a very long time ago thousands of years ago um so I'm going to put some links here below for you to go look at, and um, I hope that it just continues to broaden your eye, you know, and round out, <laughs> yeah, round out your whole understanding of this debate and why it's here, you know, because I thought this was like resolved, you know, thousands of years ago, and I thought it was like gone, but it's not. It's coming back. Um, and like I was saying, the guy that I was listening to today, he, his whole point, one of his whole points was that, you know, people want to do simple science. They want to see it right in front of them. And so, if, you know, if their eyes can't go far enough to see the curve, then it's flat. So it makes no sense at all. And scientifically or even, you know, observational, uh, when you get up higher and you can see that, you know, you're little and the earth is huge. <laughs> So yeah, everything's going to look flat to somebody who's very little on a huge ball. Okay, so I think we've covered a lot of that already. I don't really want to go back there, but I do. I did want to mention that there's some great teachers out there that I want you to look at. All right. So um, one other thing that I wanted to cover here before we uh, continue on with the biblical imagery is that you know, <laughs> I just can't believe how mean people can be. Uh, in comments and and you know it's like wow you know, just the dislikes this series and the trailer are going to get it feels like it's going to get more dislikes than likes 
and um, it's going to get more negative comments than positive comments, which is, is crazy. It, people don't understand there's a person behind the camera. <laughs> there's a person behind that YouTube channel and the person does check and does take notice and it is very hard to continue when you have such hate. So anyway, uh, I understand that everybody has their opinion and you're totally entitled to it, um, but uh, just keep hate to yourself and um, go on <laughs> somewhere else <laughs> to uh, put that. So it's really sad, but there is so many um, people who call themselves believers who are incredibly demanding, demanding of the teacher, demanding that the teacher know absolutely everything. I, I don't understand how that's possible. Like a teacher is not Elohim, right? I am not Yeshua. I am not God. I am not Yehovah Elohim or the Rock HaKodesh. So I don't know everything. You can't demand that one person know absolutely everything. But what is going to, you know, what I do know is that a teacher who, who does stand up is more accountable for what they are saying because they are teaching, right? And uh, I don't want to lead anybody astray. So um, I understand that, but, but you know, the demanding, it just blows me away. Demanding that, you know, every, you know, every sentence I say has to be backed up with scripture or whatnot, when in reality, we're looking at the context, okay? We're looking at everything as a story. Uh, we're looking at the bigger picture, and that's what we don't want to get caught up in the weeds of, you know, just focusing in one spot. So um, we're going to look at biblical imagery today, so hopefully this will help some. So let's get going. We're going to talk about biblical imagery, and then we're going to talk about is the Bible, a, no, the scriptures, a science book. Okay. So within the Messianic Hebrew uh, movement, you know, basically people coming out of Christianity into um, the Torah and into repentance, um, those people look back at their Christian friends and where they came from and they get, you know, fought, they're frustrated with that whole system there of religion, man-made religion that cherry picks verses out of the scriptures that promote sloppy grace, that in their world it promotes sloppy grace. It doesn't. The scriptures never promote sloppy grace. But uh, it's something that they cherry pick verses here and there in order to create this theology of sloppy grace, which means you don't have to do anything for your salvation. You actually just get grace and it just covers everything. You, you actually don't have to change. So, and we know that's not true, um, but the same group, 50% of them at least, who believe in flat earth, they're, chi they're cherry picking texts in order to prove flat earth from the scriptures. And these believers are completely and utterly ignoring science, true science that has been done for a very long time, proving that the earth is a sphere. And they are completely ignoring what you can actually see with your own eyes. Remember, we were talking about the phenomena that we see with our own eyes that, that doesn't exist, that could not possibly exist on a flat earth. They can see it, you know, but it doesn't fit. It can't work in the flat earth model, but they're ignoring that, okay? And also, uh, they ignore those things to argue for flat earth using texts from poetic books of the scriptures of the Bible. So biblical imagery is what this is called, and, and it's, it's a thing, okay? But they don't use discernment to understand it. All right, so flat earth people who also tote around Torah believe that the Bible is absolutely 100% literal and that none of it is poetry. So Maggie in her article writes, biblical literalism is by definition 
literal unless a passage is clearly intended by the writer to be allegorical or poetry. They believe that the Bible, it's talking about flat, earth, flat earthers, they believe that the Bible should be interpreted as literal statements by the author. Word for word. That's biblical literalism. But as Maggie points out in her article in Daniel 4, we see that Nebuchadnezzar relates his dream to Daniel, right? He is the tree in the dream, but he isn't literally a tree, all right? Plus, as I quoted before, a dream is really not a good place to be getting schooled on science. Okay, so and then let's look in Matthew 3.10. Yohanan ben Zechariah likens people to trees. Again, all right, but he didn't mean that people were literally trees, people. And Yeshua himself referred to people as trees, remember? So he talks about good fruit, a tree bearing good fruit and bad fruit. And if that tree bears bad fruit, he's going to cut it down and it's going to be thrown into the fire, right? He even curses a tree. So he's talking about people as trees, but he doesn't really mean that people are trees, right? The Bible's full of this sort of imagery, <laughs> but one can't take them as literal to, if to our eyes we observe them as not. So if you believe that these verses literally mean and really mean that people are trees, then you would be what's considered a biblical literalist. That means that pretty much nothing in all of scripture could be poetry, unless you decided it was. Isn't that handy? <laughs> okay, so I know you don't need it because you have your own eyes to witness things that can only exist on a sphere, but for people who feel that they must use the Bible to prove that the earth is either round or flat, let's look at a few more places uh, that the Bible uses imagery that some of the scattered are actually using to prove a flat earth. All right, so let's look at Job 38. One of the big ones, this is, Job 38 is one of the big ones. The imagery used in the Bible that flat earthers camp out on is the idea that the earth has literal foundations. But in Job, it seems clear that Yehovah is simply using figurative language to describe some of his activities to Job. He isn't giving a science lesson on the shape of the earth or how things work. He's mad and he's waxing poetic. Let's read it. Okay, in Job, uh, we see him say, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who fixed its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched a measuring line across it? All right, so let's just look at some of those words really quick. We have, I laid the foundation. So the foundations is the word, uh, it's 3245 Yassad, and it means established, okay? So foundations means established. It doesn't say foundations as in brick, mortar, concrete, that sort of thing. It's foundations, he established it. Where were you when I established the earth, you could say? And then let's look at the word for across it. So across it is the, across is the word um, al, A-L, and it's a 591. And it means about, um, a huge amount of things that it means, but it can mean about uh, or against or around. So why did the translators choose the word across when it could have easily been translated about, against, or around it. It's interesting because the word and the meaning for it to be the word against was used 536 times. <laughs> they chose something else that isn't, isn't um, used as much in the scriptures. So you could really say that this text says, where were you when I established the earth? Tell me if you have understanding who fixed its measurements. Surely you know or who stretched a measuring line around it. That's the way this, this whole verse could actually go, you know? So we're picking and choosing again. So let's look at the word stamp. That's another issue. We, we actually once had a family tell us that this one verse in Job uh, 38 proved to them that the earth is flat because of the word, the usage of the word uh, stamp. So it, when we read in Job uh, 38, 14, it says, the earth takes shape like clay under a seal. 
Uh, it stands, uh, its heels stand out like the folds of a garment. I think in some versions it says stamp, but let's look. The earth is the word Eretz, and that's 776 in Strong's, and that means land. That means land. So it's not really talking about the shape or the whole entire thing. It's talking about the land part. And it says, takes shape under clay, or takes shape like clay under a seal. And some some translations will say stamp there, I think. But it, that's the word um, chotham. Chotham, like Hanukkah, chotham. Uh, that's 2368 in the Strong's, and um, it means a signet ring. So I actually think that this verse is the golden child of the flat earth uh, believers because they think it's talking about the shape of the earth. Uh, they, and they are assuming a lot about what a seal or a signet ring looked like back then. Isaac actually went and researched this and determined that a lot of times the signet ring was engraved with the king's seal around a cylinder. So the king would actually take off the ring and roll it uh, on the wax to seal something, not stamp it like we would right now. But even if it was a stamp as we know it, in this text, Job is not talking about the shape of, the, of our planet. He's talking about the shape of the land so and, and what it looks like to him, right? So you could say that looking laterally, uh, you know, it, it does look, it could look like a stamp, right? Like one that you, you pull up and everything kind of comes up. We were just in the beautiful mountains of uh, central Idaho, uh, the um, what are they called? The um, sawtooth range. And it's just beautiful how they loom up and stuff. And you can see it, you know, a stamp pulled up, but it'd be like a daub of paint sort of thing. But you could say that looking laterally or from above that the land, the erets, the, the dry ground between the oceans looks, some, looks like someone could have stamped it, either, you know, rolled it out or stamped it this way. It really doesn't matter. But our earth is more than just dry, dry ground. It's more than just land, right? It also has vast oceans of water. But water would never take shape under a stamp like clay would, right? You can't stamp water, right? You can't pull water up, okay? You can't, it just won't work. You can't stamp liquid. Believers who are dabbling in flat earth and they're camping out on this text, they are misinterpreting this poetic text because Yehovah is simply talking about the land. The same word, Eretz, which is land, is used in multiple scriptures to talk about what grows out of the land. It's talking about the ground. So when we say that we want to go to Eretz Israel, we mean that we want to go to the land of Israel, not the planet of Israel. <laughs> All right? This verse is clearly not talking about the shape of the earth, but about the land. And there is a difference. Okay, so I wanted to uh, go back to the word foundations and kind of camp out there for just a minute because we need to like uh, unpack that a little bit more than what we did when we were talking about when it mentions foundations in Job 38. So let's look at Psalms 104, 5. It says, He set the earth on its foundations so that it could never, should never be moved. All right, so let's look at that word foundations. That is 4349 in Strong's and it's it's the word mason, uh, and it means a fixed, settled, or established place. All right, and then, it, and then the word for moved there is 4121, and it means, it's the word mot, uh, mot, mot, and it means not slip, shake, or totter. All right, so here we have, he set forth, he set the earth on its established place or on its fixed or settled place so that it should not be, should not slip or shake or totter. All right. That wouldn't work with the flat earth concept that we are being hurled into an upward motion of 98 miles per hour in order to continue that there is no gravity farce. Okay. But look at the use of the same word later in Psalms 89, 14, because I'm sure there's some people that can say, oh no, see Rebecca, that means it's flat. Uh, hello, I'm not done yet. <laughs> okay, so Psalms 89, 14 says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Loving devotion and faithfulness go before you. 
So let's look at that word foundation right there. So it's saying that righteousness and justice are the foundation, all right, of his throne. So let's look. That is 43, 49. It's the same word that's used in Psalms 104 for foundation. And again, it's the word mason, and it means a fixed, settled, or established place. Okay, so righteousness and justice are the established place, the settled or fixed established place of your throne. Again, the same word is used in both texts. And can you literally build a foundation of a house on righteousness and justice? Biblical literalists. No, of course you can't. You need literal bricks and mortar and stones and cement, right? But this is the same word used in Psalms 104, 5, and it's poetry, people, all right? Psalms 82, 5 says, They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. But like, and then it has a little bit more, and then it says, but like mortals, you will die, and like rulers, you will fall. All right, so he's not talking to stalactite thingies that are protruding from the bottom of a flat earth model. Clearly, he is not talking about the shape of the earth. This text is talking about the rulers of the earth as being the foundations who are out of course, and then, and whom Yehovah will actually destroy, all right? So it says the foundations of the earth are out of course. Oh, and they are so out of course, are they not? If you look at that as meaning rulers of the earth are out of course, that is the uh, 4121, the word moat, as we saw before, and it means not slip, shake, or totter. So it means that the foundations, the rulers of the world are out of course. They are shaking, they are tottering, they are, you know, um, not solid and secure in their course. And then, you know, in the end of that verse, but like mortals, you will die and like rulers, you will fall. I love that. Yehovah <laughs> himself is going to destroy them, right? Yay. All right. And Yeshua is going to when he comes back and he takes over. All right. Second Samuel 22, 15 through 19 says, Yehovah thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High resounded. He shot arrows and scattered the foes. He hurled lightning and routed them. The channels of the sea appeared and the foundations of the world were exposed at the rebuke of Yehovah. At the blast of his breath of his nostrils, he reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me, mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, uh, but Yehovah was my support. He brought me out into the open. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Okay, so this verse is not talking about the shape of the earth and some, again, some strange pillars, uh, thingies protruding down from the bottom of a flat disc. Again, in context, we can see that the word foundations here means that the rulers of it were exposed at Yah's rebuke. The foundations of the world, the rulers of the world were exposed at Yah's rebuke. That's good news. <laughs> also, there is not just one word in Hebrew for foundations either. Job 38, 6 says, On what were its foundations set or who laid its cornerstone? Okay, so foundations there is the word 134 and it's Eden and it means base. But it also can mean strength. So everybody's interpreting this as base. But it could also mean strength. And so Eden originates from the word 113, Adon, which means master or lord or owner. Okay, so then you've got the word cornerstone there. Doesn't that sound familiar, everyone? Cornerstone being Yeshua. So to understand that the earth has been established through the strength of its owner, our cornerstone would make sense in this text. In 1 Peter 2, 4 to 6, it talks about Yeshua being the living stone, the cornerstone, right? So is he really a stone? No, it is a metaphor, people. He's not a, he's not a rock, not a real tangible rock that you throw into the water. No, it's a metaphor for strength, okay? Okay, so now we have to talk about the word pillars. This is another big one in the Flat Earth camp. All right, so Bill Fortenberry from increasing, increasinglearning.com says that the Bible does not say that the earth rests on pillars. 
There are only three verses for Samuel 2, 8, Job 9, 4 to 6, Psalms 75, 2 to 4, I hope I got all this straight, which speak of the pillars of the earth. And all three are using figurative language to refer to leaders among men. This is a theme. Can you see this theme? <laughs> you have foundations, you have pillars, uh, talking about rulers and people. All right, going on with his quote, this is the same figure speech that Paul used in Galatians 2.9, where he spoke of Peter, James, and John being pillars in the church. There are only three verses that mention the pillars of the earth. And when we take the time to understand these verses, we can see that all three are using the term pillars as a figure of speech for human leaders. This goes right along with how Yehovah most of the time chooses to use the word foundations for leaders. It's talking about earth's rulers, right? All right, so we also need to talk about the four corners of the earth. This is another um, biblical piece of biblical imagery or poetry that is being used by flat earthers to prove, flat earth people who are toting Torah, to prove that the earth is flat from the scriptures, <laughs> right? Um, let's talk about that, uh, the four corners for a sec. All right, so this really actually, I think really trips people up. So reference to the four corners of the earth refers to the ends of the earth, not a four-cornered shape, box, or rectangle people. The ends of the earth refer to the people from all over the world. So then Ashley Evans writes, the four winds in Revelation 7-1 refer to the four cardinal points, north, south, east, and west, right? Most scholars agree that this was probably an idiom referencing every location on earth, even the most distant, end quote. Which would work with people coming from all over the world or all over the four corners, right? So that said, even the flat earth model itself doesn't have four corners to it, people. Although there are some flat earthers like Rob Skiba, I think that's how you say his name, who actually believe that this is literal and that we live on, get this, a square, shallow box idea with a hole cut out in the middle and a dome over it. So. You know, the image that comes to mind is, I don't know if you remember the game Sorry, you know, with that little dome thing and you press it and the thing and the dice would jump in there. So if somebody is going to be a biblical literalist and they look at this four corners of the world and they don't take into consideration what it's really talking about, which is talking about the four cardinal points of north, south, east, and west, as well as all the people coming from all over, you know, talking about all the people all over the world, then this is what it looks like, right? It's like a square and it's ridiculous. Okay, this is, this is so stupid, this is giving me, like, oh, headache. So the scripture that talks about the four corners of the earth, it's clearly not talking about the shape of the world. It's clearly talking about the four cardinal points, north, south, east, and west, as referring to all the people coming from all over the world, all over those four cardinal points. All right, so just give me a headache. <laughs> I'm done. Let's keep going. All right, so we need to talk about firmly established. All right, so 1 Corinthians 7.37 says, But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desire under control and has determined in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. All right, so that word firmly is 1476, and it means steadfast. Established actually is 2476 and it also means steadfast. So there's a double steadfast in there. It's like, but it's whosoever is a steadfast, steadfast in his heart. It's like emphasis. Remember when something in Hebrew is mentioned twice or in the scriptures is mentioned twice, this isn't in Hebrew, this is in first Corinthians, but if it's mentioned twice, then it means it's very important. So listen up, right? It's really truth. So this person who is going to marry is firmly established in his heart. He's steadfast, steadfast. This is what he's going to do. Then he'll do fine. And so then let's look at, I believe it's uh, Psalms 93.1 that the flat earthers um, tote uh, that says the world is firmly established. Uh, it cannot be shaken. All right. So that, that word firmly established, that is uh, one word that's 3559. Uh, and it's the word sun in the Hebrew. I don't know how you say it soon or something, but it means to be firm certain, ordained, steadfast. 
All right. So this text is not talking about the shape of the earth, but about whether or not the thing, both, both verses, both texts, is talking about whether or not the thing is steadfast in its course. Okay. The first verse you see a man is uh, set on a course to get married. So he is on that course to get married and he's steadfast in that course, right? The, in Psalms 93, we see that the earth is steadfast in its course as well. It's firmly established. It's certain. It's ordained. It's steadfast. It cannot be shaken. It's going to continue in that course and it's not going to totter or, or fly off into a black hole somewhere. Okay. All right. That's, a, that's really important. If you're on a, on a ball, you don't want it to wobble, do you? And here's another interesting thing. If you read all of 93, Psalms 93, you will discover that uh, Yahweh says that neither he will wobble. He's not going to wobble. He's going to stay steadfast in his course, um, even if the waters rise on the earth. So I, find, I found that super interesting that um, if you continue on in that chapter, it's really talking about him and the fact that he is not going to stray or wobble from his steadfast course uh, so I like that a lot. Again, this verse doesn't tell us that the earth is not rotating. It doesn't tell us about the shape of the earth. It tells us that the earth will not stray from its course. So the idea that is being painted here in Psalms 93 is that the earth has been put on its course and it will not stray from it, just like Yehovah will not stray from his course and, and being faithful to us. And this is actually super good news for believers as there is a you know pretty big movement out there to uh, worship uh, Mother Earth to have there's Earth Day and all this other stuff and it feels like you know the environmentalists and the you know the left wants us to uh, believe that the earth is failing in its course that at some point we're going to be we're all doomed to die because the planet is going to get too close to the sun and, and we're all going to be burnt up right and they say that we can as humans we can save the planet right by I don't know recycling foil or something or stopping to use paper products which I found out isn't so, <laughs> that that won't help at all no humans can't save this planet Yehovah is going to save this planet we must remember this right as we're being sold that lie there's so many lies are being sold but we don't want to buy into the lie that we can save the planet okay yes humans are wasteful Absolutely. And yes, humans generally are dirty. I'm not, but there's, you know, you just look around and it's crazy how incredibly dirty humans are. And humans have not taken care of this planet um, as we were instructed to do, right? We haven't taken care of it. Of course not. Um, and through humans, Hasatan has very much destroyed this beautiful planet, this beautiful blue marble. He has totally destroyed so much of it. But unlike the environmentalists and the, the left that are pushing this, we can't save the planet. It's Yehovah that will save the planet. And he has a plan to do that. All right. And he said that he won't let earth be removed from his course. So he promised that he's good for his word. It's not going to go falling off into the sun, nor I can get burnt up. We have, we're having weather changes. Yes, we're having issues with nature. Absolutely. But it's prophesied that it was supposed to happen, right? It's been prophesied. We knew that this would happen at the end of the age and we're at the end of the age. Okay. He's coming. Yes. But in, we knew, he said all these things would happen, right? So things are going crazy in nature because it's prophesied. It's supposed to happen. So don't get your panties in a bunch over it and don't go get all in, you know, invested in, in the environmentalist movement of saving the earth. Okay. Just clean up your own spot. Don't be dirty. You've got a little kingdom that he's given you and just be very careful with it and be and honor him with it and do your best with it. Keep it clean, keep it beautiful, take care of your animals, you know, take care of your, your domain, all right, so that you can face him in the end and you can answer truthfully that you did your best and that you took care of what he gave you, okay? But you and I can't save the planet, he's going to do that. All right, but he promised that uh, whatever crazy natural disasters are happening right now, they are ordained and he promised that he would not let this world spin out of control. All right. Um, 
So this is actually, now that I think about it, probably another golden child of the Flat Earth Movement. In Isaiah 40, 23, it says, He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. Its dwellers are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. So this is another verse that a flat earth biblical literalist will use to tote their lie. Okay, again, we have to use discernment, people. If you look at a globe or a ball from directly above, yes, it's going to look like a circle. Of course, it's going to look like a circle. All right, and so, but this is poetry. In the same verse, we know that the dwellers of the earth are not grasshoppers. But we look like grasshoppers to somebody who's way up in the sky, right? So I actually have flown nearly 30 times myself in my life. I have seen the curve of the earth myself, and I have seen, I've looked down and seen people looking like ants. And I have said it before, I said, man, they look like ants. But I didn't mean that they were literally ants. I just meant that they look like ants. They, they, this is poetry. This is a metaphor, okay? So this verse is actually a very interesting verse uh, in that it helps us understand the light years and how Yehovah created them. So I don't know if you know, but ICR is a great place to study from. And it's called, it's the Institute for Creation Research, which our family loves them. Um, they, of course, they're Christian and they come at it from that perspective, but they've got a ton of science behind stuff and they unpack creation. It's really cool. They unpack the phenomena of light years by studying this verse. And through the method of stretching out the heavens, Yehovah may have created the planets and stars on day four that were instantly light years away, millions of light years away and stuff. As he stretched them out, that's how he did it on day four. And, and you should uh, look into ICR Institute there and find out for yourself how they uh, unpack that verse. And perhaps that's how Yehovah created um, those stars that are so far away. Okay, so we have talked about biblical imagery. Now I just want to touch again on secret knowledge. I know we talked about it before, but I want to talk about it just for a quick sec again. So an unknown author writes about the flat earth and says, quote, one attraction may be similar to the allure of an ancient philosophy called Gnosticism, which infiltrated the church, the early church. One of the tenets of Gnosticism is that special knowledge leads one either to salvation or to a higher spiritual level. Christian flat earthers seem to believe that they have learned some important teaching about cosmology that has been hidden from most Christians. They speak of having a much deeper appreciation of God since coming to believe that the earth is flat." End quote. So, of course, those who have come out of Christianity and are returning back to Yehovah and to His law, um, we are some of the first to recognize that Christianity has taught us in the past error and lies when it comes to holidays and God's name and the name of His Son and what grace is and how we are saved and the, the Ruach HaKodesh, the gender of the Ruach HaKodesh. But Christians, they haven't lied about absolutely everything that's actually part of the danger. Half-truths are more dangerous than full lies, all right? That said, as we discover the truth and the errors that we were taught within pagan Christianity, we must realize that truth is not and has never been secret knowledge, all right? For example, the truth about where the pagan holidays come from has always been there. It has never been a secret. It's not been a secret. It's always been there. Their roots have just been ignored and not taught. The fact that Yehovah has holy days for us to honor has always been there in the scriptures. The fact that they are commanded has just been ignored. And so yes, these things are coming out into the light for all of us to see, but they were not and they never were secret knowledge. All right. Yeah. So flat earth, that, that doesn't even belong in the category of truth being rediscovered like Yehovah's feast days. All right, those were always there for us to see. This flat earth doesn't belong in the same category at all. It's not at all truth being rediscovered because it ain't true. It's not true at all. So don't twist my words, people. I know some of you are going to, but don't twist my words. All right, this calls for mature discernment. All right, so Yehovah. May he bless you with clarity and may he dis 
He deliver you and rescue you from this lie. I mean, all right. Thank you for watching. So stay tuned for part 10, where we will look at modern gurus of the flat earth movement, uh, dangers of this belief. Why is it dangerous? And the traits of uh, conspiracy theorists. All right. So I'm, I'm excited to talk about that one. Some modern gurus and the dangers. Why do we, why am I even doing this? Because I think it's a danger. I think it's dangerous. So we're going to talk about that. You know, whether it's a salvation issue or not. So don't forget to like and subscribe and all that stuff. And I will see you later. Shalom. Bye. Okay. Doors shut. Whew, it's hot in here. All the lights. <laughs>